This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Ian Baruma is the award-winning author and journalist who serves as the Henry R. Luce Professor of Democracy, Human Rights, and Journalism at Bard College. His many books include Anglomania, Inventing Japan, The China Lover, and most importantly, I think for our purposes this evening, in terms of his earlier work, Murder in Amsterdam, Liberal Europe, Islam, and the Limits of Tolerance which won a Los Angeles Times Book Award. In 2008, he was awarded the International Erasmus Prize for making an especially important contribution to culture, society, and social science in Europe. That same year, he was also voted as one of the top 100 public intellectuals by Foreign Policy Prospect Magazine. And then again that year, he received the Shorenstein Journalism Award from Harvard University, which honors a journalist not only distinguished for a body of work, but also for the particular way that he has helped Americans understand the complexities of Asia. Clearly, a very good year. Baruma's latest book, which incidentally you may purchase courtesy of Borders and have signed after the event here on stage, along with some of his earlier titles, is called Taming the Gods, Religion and Democracy on Three Continents. It's an extraordinary tour de force. It deftly explores the relationship between organized religion and public life in three distinct settings, the United States, Europe, and Asia. Very few people have the kind of cosmopolitan outlook and erudition required to do this sort of comparative history. And in his hands, it's done remarkably well. In a debate driven by raucous emotion, observed Britain's literary review, Baruma is the quiet voice of reason. If there's a lesson that emerges from his inquiry, it is that there are many ways of integrating religion into society. Tonight, he'll be discussing the Muslim scare in Europe, hysteria or threat. Please join me in welcoming Ian Baruma. I will talk about uh, the scare uh, of Islam in Europe and um, start by observing that 9-11 uh, um, has had uh, as one consequence the fact that um, we now have a huge number of instant experts on Islam um, in the world um, and um, I must uh, confess that I'm one of them I didn't write about it much before then um, and now there is a whole a spate of books coming out uh, in this last in, in this year uh, about uh, warning us about the dangers um, of Islam in Europe and the challenges to Western civilization and so on and so forth. Um, some of these books are crude, uh, some of them are a bit more sophisticated, but all of us, all of them, uh, warn us uh, that Islam is a serious challenge to liberal values, Western civilization, Western values, or whatever one wishes to call them. Um, the titles of these books are uh, revealing of the, of the mood of the time. Um, I'll mention one, uh, a book that's uh, just coming out, if it isn't already out, called The New Vichy Syndrome. Um, the language um, and the rhetoric of World War II, of course, is not uh, there uh, by accident. Uh, to many of the people who warn us about the, what they call the Islamization of Europe or uh, the future of Europe as Eurabia, um, the tone of these uh, warnings is often that we are living uh, in 1938 uh, all over again. And um, that we're facing what is called Islamofascism. Um, 
And what is meant, of course, is that uh, the threat posed, supposedly posed by um, political Islam, but perhaps by Islam per se, uh, is comparable to what was threatening the Western world, the, the Western democracies in 1938, that this is a new wave of, uh, as it were, uh, fascism, uh, and that um, we have to stand up to defend our civilization against it. Um, it has, uh, of course, as a result, if you put it in these terms, that it's no longer really a debate between people who might have uh, somewhat different views uh, or is th threatening us. It's, it's, it's not really a, a debate at all. It's a division uh, between friends and enemies, um, resistors um, and, uh, on one side and appeasers or collaborationists or collaborators uh, on the other which makes uh, debating this issue uh, somewhat uh, problematic. Um, I know this language of World War II very well uh, because I grew up just after, or, or at least five years after uh, the war uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and the Netherlands, of course, uh, like almost uh, the whole of the rest of Europe, was, or had been occupied by Nazi Germany. Um, and when I grew up, uh, various things were still not discussed, the Holocaust really being one of them. It only began to be discussed in the 1960s seriously. Uh, began with the Eichmann trial and then um, uh, gradually uh, what had happened, the full horror of what had happened, um, began to be discussed in, in European countries, at schools and elsewhere. But when I was at primary school, there wasn't really all that much talk about the Holocaust, but there was a huge amount of talk about who had been, in, as the Dutch put it, good or wrong, or good or bad. Uh, it was a morality tale. It was uh, who had collaborated, who hadn't, as though uh, the population, in retrospect, could be so neatly divided. Um, and uh, this had many consequences. One was, for example, one knew exactly where to uh, go shopping. Uh, you knew that to go to buy your meat at a certain butcher's, you couldn't, as a respectable person, really do, because that person had been bad. Uh, you knew that you couldn't go and buy uh, candy or licorice at a particular tobacco store because that woman had had a German boyfriend during the war. Uh, and, uh, of course, all one's teachers had been brave resistors and all had um, uh, heroic stories of daring do, like uh, sending German soldiers in the wrong direction when they asked for how to get to the nearest railway station and that sort of stuff. Um, but this division into good and bad, uh, collaborators and resistors, was, was, was um, very clear um, and, of course, false because um, in these situations, under a brutal occupation, most people are neither good nor bad. Uh, they try, most people try and survive as best they can, uh, and that's, uh, generally speaking, not to be heroes. Uh, the, the real heroes, or people who actually were active in resistance, um, normally is less than 10% of the population, and the same goes for active collaborators. Most people are in a grayer area. But that we only really knew later. But the rhetoric is still there. So when um, the challenges posed by uh, Muslims, by political Islam in Europe, began to be uh, debated and discussed um, in the press and elsewhere, um, the, the, the kind of morality tale and, the, and the, the language of the morality tale of World War II came right back, as it usually does in a country like Holland when, thing, when, when a debate involves questions of ethnicity, minorities, uh, race, uh, and so on. It's, it's, it's a, a perspective that lends itself to this, uh, which is not always helpful. In fact, uh, often I would say uh, the contrary. Um, it also reminds me a little bit, the tone of the debate, not the subject itself, but the tone of the debate to arguments that one heard in the 1980s um, about Japan. Uh, Japan um, imminently taking over the world. Uh, Japan sucking up all the wealth of the United States. Um, Japan that had to, the, J the Japan problem that had to be stopped uh, in order to uh, protect um, our Western civilization against this uh, um, dangerous nation. And uh, again, I remember 
personally being um, present at discussions where uh, the question was um, who got it and who didn't, who saw the real danger and the real threat of Japan and who didn't. Now, as we know, this is not a subject that's um, very often discussed anymore. Uh, in fact, it uh, disappeared from the radar screen surprisingly quickly. Now, I don't want to, to, want to compare the um, perceived threat of Japan then to the problems posed by Islam today, but the tone of the, of the debate between uh, dividing um, people uh, in, in between friends and enemies, uh, collaborators, corrupted um, by the enemy and so on, was uh, actually remarkably similar. Now, how big is the danger of Islam in Europe? And I'll confine my remarks now to Europe um, because I've written about it and I know more about that than I know uh, about other aspects of this problem, but we, in the question and answer session we can still uh, talk about the United States in comparison. Uh, and perhaps other parts of the world. But how big is the, th is the threat really in Europe? Well, one thing is for sure, it's not 1938. Um, however uh, dangerous and potentially violent um, political Islam, pol Islamic extremism may be um, in Europe, uh, it's not the same threat that was posed by uh, Nazi Germany, which was after all one of the strongest, uh, most modern, uh, most militarized societies uh, in the Western world. There's nothing similar to that, uh, not even Iran, which is in many ways still a very um, poor and, and backward country. But certainly the uh, political uh, Islamism, even the, the extreme versions of it, uh, cannot be compared to the threat of Nazi Germany. So it's not as though we're faced again with uh, another wave uh, of fascism. But there are still problems. One cannot just dismiss them and say that there's nothing uh, going on. And I would say there are, one, can, one can identify at least three problems, three different problems. Um, and I think one of the problems um, uh, 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 with the debate about these issues is that these uh, issues are, are often conflated as though they're uh, the same problem. Um, and I'll identify three. Um, one is uh, the usual tensions that arise from immigration, uh, especially immigration from poor countries. Um, old working class neighborhoods that uh, change very rapidly, which are very, have a high density of new immigrants. Uh, in the case of Europe, high unemployment amongst young immigrants or children of immigrants, and consequently, relatively high uh, crime figures um, as well. That is one uh, issue. The other issue is the fact that you have many people who arrive uh, in the case of Europe, not as immigrants as they would be in the United States, but as guest workers, uh, more akin to the uh, Mexicans uh, in this country, um, who come from small villages in Morocco and Turkey largely, um, and uh, have views, uh, for example, on the relations between men and women, or on homosexuality, which are not uh, in line with the uh, conventional views of modern liberal Europe. That's the second problem, that creates tensions. Third problem um, is uh, the potential and indeed real violence that comes from a revolutionary extremist political movement uh, that uh, f inside the uh, Islamic world. Um, I think we should take these one by one. Um, street violence, the relatively high uh, crime figures, are real. It, it is a social problem. But of course they have very little to do, in fact nothing to do, uh, with religion or the challenges, challenges posed by uh, political Islam. Um, they're a social economic problem and um, the solution to the extent that there are solutions, or easy solutions, which of course there never are, but the solution to these problems are again social and economic and political. It means um, everything has to be done to make it easier for immigrants uh, and the children of immigrants to find jobs, to be integrated into uh, the economies of Western Europe. Uh, people have to be 
uh, integrated as uh, equal citizens um, and, and so on. So the, this is not uh, a religious problem. The problem of, of uh, let us call them illiberal attitudes uh, that you find amongst people who come from uh, village cultures in North Africa and the Middle East uh, is a somewhat different one. Uh, and there, I think, you cannot, cannot really uh, generalize too much. I think you have to look at this uh, case by case. For example, um, how much of a, a threat is it to our liberties that some parents would insist that their daughters um, should not um, uh, take part in mixed uh, bathing in swimming pools, or uh, the question of the headscarves should um, young women be allowed to wear headscarves in public places, which in France uh, they're not. Then there's the, the issue of where, whether burkas, that is covering the uh, face as well as the body, uh, should be banned or not, which is now an issue not only in France but in Belgium uh, and other places as well. Um, then there are the, uh, the issues of um, uh, hostility towards um, uh, gay men uh, as well. Now, myself, I've often been accused uh, not only of being soft on Islam, because uh, I feel that you have to take a lot of these, uh, the feelings of the, the European Muslims into consideration, but I've been accused of tolerating intolerance by not trying to crack, not, not wishing to crack down on attitudes which may not be entirely in line with um, our modern uh, liberal, uh, the modern liberal consensus. I believe that you can tolerate a great deal of intolerance as long as it's on the level uh, of opinion. After all, uh, there are many intolerant opinions in our societies, uh, and not only amongst Muslims, by no means only amongst Muslims. And uh, it's perfectly possible uh, to tolerate them as long as uh, there is no question of uh, violence or the threat of violence. I think as soon, that's where you draw the line. As soon as people threaten or use violence to impose their views on the majority, uh, I think you do have to uh, crack down. But as long as that's not the case, you can tolerate a great deal. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to give in, uh, in fact, I think it's a very bad idea to give in to intimidation. And again, this is not just uh, a question of Muslims. Uh, I would use as, as, as one example uh, a play written by a young uh, woman in Britain from the Sikh community. Uh, and the play was set in a Sikh temple. And it was about uh, a rape case. And um, before the play was put on, um, uh, self um, or soi disant uh, leaders of the Sikh community uh, protested and said this was a gross insult to the Sikhs of Britain um, and uh, violence was threatened if this play was put on. As a result, the police, this was in a town in the Midlands, uh, said they could not guarantee the safety of uh, the actors in the public and the play was, uh, was, was um, shelved. I think this was a mistake. I think you, you, if you go down that route, uh, there really is uh, damage done to the cause of free speech. Uh, I would say the same thing, um, but this question came up during lunch today, I think I would say the same thing about the threats made to the producers of South Park. I don't think you should allow people to dictate the content of a television show uh, in that by threatening violence. People are absolutely entitled to uh, voice their uh, displeasure with the content of such a show and even protest, but not uh, by issuing violent threats. As soon as you give in to that, you have done damage. Uh, again, I would say the same about uh, the um, decision of Yale University Press not to print um, the uh, notorious Danish cartoons in a book that was actually about the Danish cartoons. I mean, if you're going to publish a book about this subject, you might as well show the readers what it's about and not to publish them simply because people uh, threaten uh, to use violence in, in case you do, uh, I think is a, is a serious uh, mistake. Um, now the third uh, problem, that of revolutionary violence, is perhaps the most serious. Uh, the kind of violence perpetrated by Al-Qaeda, 
uh, the thing narrowly, sort of thing narrowly avoided uh, in Times Square in New York uh, a week ago. And uh, here I would say uh, there are differences between um, revolutionary violence, the revolutionary cause, uh, in the Middle East and in Europe. But because of the world we live in, because of um, instant communication, uh, everything that is local very quickly becomes global. And so what happens in the context of the Middle East, for reasons that have everything to do with the polit politics there, very quickly affect behavior um, in Europe, which have very little to do, uh, and in fact affect people who ha have absolutely nothing to do with the politics of the Middle East. But there is a kind of cross-fertilization, if you uh, wish to call it that. Um, I, I think that the uh, violent Islamism uh, in the Middle East can be explained um, by looking at the kind of politics of the Middle East, especially in the Arab world. Most Arab countries are not uh, governed by Islamic gov uh, governments. In fact, Iran is an exception. Most of them are secular police states. And the obvious form of rebellion against a secular police state um, ruled by a corrupt elite and that is seen in the eyes of, of most of the citizens who are oppressed by this elite as people who are corrupted by uh, the West, um, it's not illogical that the rebellion against that would go through uh, the mosque. After all, religion is a very convenient way to mobilize people uh, in a rebellion against an oppressive regime. regime. It's, it's a source of an alternative morality, uh, it, has an it has the capacity to organize uh, and so on in, in the way that the Catholic Church played a large role in, in countries like Poland uh, when they were under communist uh, rule. This is not to excuse the tactics uh, of violent revolutionary movements in the Middle East, but it's simply to try to put it into a political context to explain why it, uh, it occurred. Now, in Western Europe, young people who are uh, susceptible to this kind of violence their situation is, of course, very different. They're not fighting uh, sec secular police states. They're living in democracies. But like young people everywhere, especially young men, but not just young men, um, uh, young uh, children of immigrants uh, can be vulnerable when they grow up. They haven't found their uh, place in society yet. Uh, they're looking for some kind of meaning. Uh, and like young people everywhere, they are vulnerable to uh, extreme causes, whether they're religious or uh, political. We know that from campuses all over the world. Um, I think perhaps the children of immigrants who can easily feel humiliated for one reason or another, they see their parents being uh, mistreated in stores because they don't speak the local language properly, uh, they get rejected by uh, a girlfriend or two, they don't get a job they'd hoped for, and so on. There are all kinds of reasons why somebody can feel rejected, vulnerable, humiliated, resentful. Such people are, uh, as I said, um, vulnerable to extreme causes, but unlike, say, Hindus, um, uh, Muslims uh, have a ready-made cause in the form of this political Islam that uh, comes out of the Middle East for reasons that have nothing to do uh, with them. But I think to understand the, the, the psychology, the mental mentality of such people, and they are a minority, of course, but a minority can still do a lot of damage, to understand the mentality of such people, it doesn't really help to become a student of the Quran, as some people suggest. Uh, it's much more fruitful, I think, to read Joseph Conrad's novels about the anarchists in the tw early 20th century, the, the young man who feels that the whole world is against him and therefore w needs to wreak revenge on that world by uh, walking around London anonymously with a, with, a tight, with a bomb in his pocket. I think that's much closer to the young Islamist revolutionary uh, than anything that can be explained through uh, traditional culture. In fact, I think the whole idea of the clash of civilizations, the idea that it's one traditional culture uh, rubbing up against another, is the wrong way to uh, analyze this problem. Uh, if it were that, then the original guest workers, these men who came from small villages in Morocco and Turkey, 
would be the problem because they really do have a different culture. They, their culture is, is, really is alien to that of modern Western Europe, but they're actually not a problem at all. It's the, it's the people who were born and, grow, and who grew up in the West who are, on the whole, uh, ones, the ones who, who, who are vulnerable to uh, political extremism. And, and not just the immigrants, by the way. Uh, some of them, of course, are, are Western converts, and converts, as usual, uh, tend to be more zealous um, than people who are born into a particular uh, religion. So it's, it's wrong to see it as one tradition uh, rubbing up against another. Indeed, I think modern forms of, of Islamism, including Wahhabism, uh, are not traditional at all. Uh, they borrow from certain traditions, but they're not, they're, they're not traditional. They're, they're forms of born-again uh, Islam. And the reason that the purism of Wahhabism appeals is precisely because it lacks a tradition. It's not something that comes out of villages in the Middle East or North Africa. It's something, it's a purist ideology uh, that's disseminated off on the internet, often usually in English, uh, and that appeals to people who um, are alienated from the, the actual cultural traditions of their parents or grandparents, but feel equally alienated from the country in which they grow up. So this, this kind of purism appeals precisely for that, that reason. Um, again, I think the, 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 the examples of um, specific individuals who, who are involved in this kind of violence um, tell the story. I mean, the killer of Theo van Gogh, Theo van Gogh, about whom I wrote, is a very good example. He was born in Amsterdam, uh, was not interested in religion at all, was not traditional in any sense. He was interested in soccer and in girls and in drinking beer and getting high. And then, uh, like a lot of these uh, kids, um, somehow felt that one too many doors had been slammed in his face or whatever it was, but wanted to take revenge on a society that he thought um, had uh, let him down, was against him. And so he literally downloaded his rather half-baked Islamic extremism from the internet. Um, the man who put bombs in the London subway, same thing. Mohammed Siddiqui, known as Sid to his friends uh, at a, a very British school, played cricket, um, was not religious, picked it up later through Wahhabism, uh, joined this movement, felt empowered, uh, and came at it that way, not through any kind of traditional way. Now, if we see these three problems, street violence, petty crime, uh, illiberal attitudes from village cultures, and revolutionary uh, Islam, if we see it all as the same thing, then we really do end up with a kind of Kulturkampf. Then it's, it's, it's all against all. Um, then we really do uh, have a huge problem because that means that millions and millions of European citizens, simply because they are Islamic or from an Islamic background, are potential threats and potential enemies. Uh, and that way, of course, uh, lies huge violence. This is the theological view of the problem. Um, somebody who in, uh, has said many sensible things about the oppression of women, for example, in the name of religion, uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's become quite uh, well known in the United States too because of her, her autobiography. She takes this view, the theological view. She herself was, joined the Muslim Brotherhood as a kind of uh, teenage rebellion when she grew up in Kenya. Uh, she became an atheist, was converted, as it were, to atheism when she came to Holland to escape an arranged mar marriage. And she, but like many atheists, uh, the zeal of her early, uh, earlier religious allegiances simply was transferred uh, to her anti-religious atheist allegiance. And she uh, uh, characterized 9-11 uh, as follows. She said, this is not simply something that is linked to Islam or about is, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, part of Islam. This is the core of Islam. Now, if we see it that way, we do have a, a very serious problem. Um, this is also the way that a lot of uh, demagogues in Europe who talk about Eurabia, Islamization, and so on, uh, see the problem as well. It's not just, uh, in their view, a, a question of uh, Islamist extremists. In their view, it's Islam per se, which is why 
somebody like Geert Wilders, uh, uh, the populist demagogue in, in my native country, has advocated deportation of uh, Muslims, even when they're Dutch citizens. Um, he's also suggested um, uh, a, a so-called headscarf tax, taxing people if they want, wish to wear uh, headscarves as a symbol of their religion. Uh, this, I think, if we take this theological view instead of a political and social view uh, of the um, problem, uh, I, th I think that th then we invite uh, more violence. And um, uh, perhaps worst of all, uh, we cannot really isolate the, 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 the really violent revolutionary element because in order to isolate it, you need the non-violent Muslim citizens of European democracies on the side of those democracies. If you push them into a corner, if you push them into a defensive by saying the problem is Islam per se, you create uh, wider sympathies, even amongst those who are, are themselves not revolutionaries, for the revolutionary element and make it much harder uh, to solve uh, the problem. Now, I also think um, that the panic about Islamism, the, the specter of Eurabia, um, is a symptom of, of a much wider and, and, and deeper problem uh, in uh, Europe, but not only in Europe. And I think what's happening all over uh, the democratic world, whether it's in Thailand or in Europe or in the United States, is that populism has become, as it were, more popular. Uh, the elites are now everywhere uh, under siege. Everywhere there are now more and more people who talk about um, wanting um, to get the, as it were, their country back uh, from the elites who has, have supposedly uh, taken it away from them. The language is different. Uh, the issues are not always the same, d depending on the histories of various places. Uh, but uh, the underlying attitudes, I think, are similar. The, there are great similarities between the Tea Party, many of the Tea Party uh, uh, people, uh, to uh, the followers of somebody like Geert Wilders uh, in the Netherlands. And I think the, the reason for this um, is not in the first place a perceived threat of Islam. The reasons are several. I think there are uh, general anxieties everywhere about uh, the consequences of globalization, about uh, uh, the, uh, econ the financial crises, about a sense, as this is especially true in Europe, um, partly because since World War II, Europeans have been t been uh, consistently told by the elites that national identity is something of the past, we should all be Europeans now, and so on. Uh, and the fact that, Europe, that globalization has, uh, is perceived to have, and not entirely without reason, have created new classes, uh, global classes of haves and have-nots, some people who benefit from globalization, others who are left behind. This is caused all kinds of fears and anxieties which are blamed on the elites. And because uh, the elite in Europe, the, 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 the sort of left of center, the liberal elite, have been more or less uh, in power in most countries uh, for most, uh, most of the post-war period, they're blamed now for such things as multiculturalism, uh, which is seen as a great f failure and which is some, somehow seen as something that has undermined uh, not only Western values or Western civilization, but our own national identities. We don't know who we are anymore. We don't know what to believe anymore. We don't really have anything to believe anymore. And in this vacuum, these Muslims who still believe in something fervently even will come and take us over. That's, that's the fear. Now, what are the Western values that people are so afraid uh, of losing, that are supposedly under threat? Now, here it becomes very murky. Some people, uh, Geert Wilders being one of them, talk about Judeo-Christian civilization, as though the Jews and the Christians were always such brothers in arms uh, in the building of uh, uh, great civilization. Um, not that many people talk about that, it's, it's certainly not in Europe, because Europe has become too secularized. I think that the people who now talk about enlightenment values as a kind of badge of European identity or Western identity, 
uh, 40 years ago probably would have still talking about, talk, been talking about Christendom. But now to talk about Christendom, unless you're the Pope, uh, or um, people who still believe in the Pope, a dwindling number of people in Europe, um, doesn't really make a huge amount of sense anymore. So now it's suddenly become enlightenment values. Uh, but people are not entirely clear what they mean by enlightenment values either. Uh, sometimes they think of Voltaire and free speech and so on. They very rarely think of, say, the Marquis de Sade, who was uh, just as much a product uh, of the Enlightenment as Voltaire was. But they talk loosely um, about uh, the Enlightenment. Now, the odd thing, the paradoxical thing, is that the same people who talk about um, protecting Enlightenment values against the uh, intolerant uh, Islam, uh, Muslims um, actually often use the, the, the same kind of jargon and language of uh, the very people who were enemies of Enlightenment values in the Enlightenment uh, in the earlier parts of the 20th century. They, even, the, the, uh, even as they warn us uh, that we're, still, we're living in 1938 again, they use the language of the people, uh, the, the, the nationalists, uh, the anti-liberal nationalists and so on, uh, of the um, interwar period, who in many ways are much more responsible for uh, national socialism and fascism. Um, as intellectual forebears uh, than the liberals were. And by this I mean the kind of people who in the 1910s and 1920s uh, uh, talked about uh, liberals as people who undermined European values, people who, on, who, who only believed in bourgeois comforts. Heidegger was one of these people, and he, had to, he coined the wonderful term comfortismus, comfortism, the sort of the, the, the lazy, uh, nihilist, bourgeois, liberal, who only thought of his creature comforts, who had no higher ideals for which to um, battle and sacrifice and so on, who had no stomach uh, for, uh, for war, who was uh, anti-heroic. And the, I, I think that the language, it's, 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 it's very marked if you look at it closely. The lang language of those who talk about Eurabia and Islamization and so on tends to be uh, uh, language in the heroic mode. The heroes who resisted to stand up uh, for Western civilization have the courage to do so, and those who are seeking some kind of accommodation with European Muslims who are seen as weak need, uh, not believing in anything, relativistic, appeasers, collaborators, uh, and so on. Um, and this, by the way, includes another uh, canard that you always uh, found in, in history when it comes to unpopular minorities, which is this notion that they're outbreeding us. Uh, they're breeding like rabbits. Soon they'll take over, they'll be the majority, and so on, which is um, uh, something that was said about the Jews too at one time. Uh, it's, 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 it's a common uh, paranoid paradigm. Uh, quite wrong, uh, in fact, because Muslims are no different from anybody else. Uh, in the first place, of course, um, many Muslims in Europe are not uh, great, not particularly pious, sometimes not at all, but they're like everybody else in that when they move up into the middle class, when they become more affluent, they have fewer children, uh, and, um, which is already happening. And so uh, a lot of these projections uh, are uh, simply uh, in my view, um, uh, manifestations of, of paranoia. But the notion that liberals don't believe in anything uh, needs, to be taken into, needs to be taken seriously. I think it's wrong. Uh, liberals do believe in something. Um, but it's, it's a common perception. It needs to be countered. And I think it is true, and one of the reasons that these panics and this language of the 1920s and 30s uh, suddenly become uh, so current again, even amongst uh, very intelligent people, often people who used to be on the left, who should know better. I think the, 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 one of the reasons for this is that the liberal elites have indeed lost their nerve in some ways and have, and have lost their way. Um, I think that the collapse of social democratic ideals uh, has a lot to do with this. And this has much to do, of course, with the general collapse of everything that is even loosely associated with, uh, with the left, with Marxism. Um, uh, 
1989, when uh, and we, we all applauded it, of course, when the communist world uh, basically collapsed, um, even in China in its, in its odd way, um, uh, it, in a way the baby got, um, uh, uh, what's the expression? Um, uh, exactly. Um, <laughs> And uh, it left uh, the sort of the, the, the center left, the liberals, um, without uh, ideals. And politics became more and more uh, a form of, of marketing. And uh, I think here there is, there is a, a, a genuine problem. Because without ideals, um, it's very difficult to maintain uh, a viable um, liberal democracy. And I, th I would quote here my friend and, and co-author on one of my books, uh, Avishai Margalit, who identified two uh, kinds of politics. One kind he calls religious politics, and that's not the politics of a particular religious denomination or faith, but it's the politics uh, that um, uh, lay claim to an absolute truth that have a utopian ideal of an, of, of an ideal society and have a kind of idea of the sacred for which people can sacrifice. Um, it's the kind of politics, of course, with which compromise becomes very difficult because to compromise is to compromise the very principle. And if you believe in revealed truth or a utopian ideal or absolute, absolute truth, it becomes very difficult to compromise. The other kind of politics, economic politics, is about interests. About interests you can, uh, you can compromise, you can wheel and deal, you give something, you get something, and so on. Now, no society can be made up entirely of economic politics or of religious politics. You need a little bit of both. You need some idealism, but also you need flexibility to be able to compromise about interests. And... Um, the proper uh, response to the challenge, such as it is, uh, from uh, the new Muslim citizens of Europe cannot be uh, separated, I think, from, these, from this particular uh, political problem of having, having lost a sense of idealism, a sense of where we're going as, as liberals. So liberalism really needs uh, a new project. It needs something that can restore uh, its appeal to people that is not simply uh, a material one. Um, and I think in this sense, uh, Muslims, or the presence of large numbers of Muslim, European Muslims, European Muslim citizens, could be seen, as it is by uh, those who, who, who have taken up the scare, um, as a threat to liberal values, but it could also be seen in a very different way. It could be seen in some ways, possibly, uh, as a contribution to um, a revival of a certain kind of liberal idealism. It could go either way. Probably, uh, since the world is a messy place, it'll go both ways, um, and, um, but you can only hope that it uh, ends up uh, in a more positive situation than a negative one. And, uh, to, be, to end on a positive note, and this is not a, uh, me looking at a crystal ball and, and predicting what's going to happen in the future, but to end on a positive note, um, I would uh, remind you of an anecdote uh, about which I've written um, in the book about Theo van Gogh, but it's, it's something that impressed me deeply. And it was um, when I had lunch with uh, a law professor at Leiden University who uh, was born in Iran, grew up in Iran, came from the f far left uh, in Iran, Iranian politics, the two-day party, uh, and so took part in the revolution against the Shah. But the left, of course, was betrayed by the Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, and uh, this uh, law professor, uh, Afshin Elian, had to flee uh, the Netherlands. He fled to Kabul, where he spent some time, and then came to, to Holland. Um, and he's one of these people uh, uh, from Muslim countries, an immigrant, who doesn't tire of warning uh, the Dutch, whom he sees as soft and decadent and not prepared to stand up for their values, their civilization, have no stomach for compromise, and all that language. 
Um, and uh, I had l lunch with him uh, at, in the canteen of the law faculty at Leiden University where he teaches. And he was warning me about uh, the dangers of Islam and the decadence of the Dutch and uh, so on. And I, as he was talking, I was looking around me and I saw that more than half of the students, the law students having their lunch in the canteen were young women, uh, and not only young women, but young women in headscarves. And uh, what it means is that um, many uh, young women actually, uh, and this is not only true in the Netherlands, it's also true in Britain and um, maybe in France and Germany too, uh, uh, high ex are very ambitious, um, in the words of my eldest daughter who went to a very mixed school in North London, they're SWATs, they have get higher grades than uh, other kids, um, and many of them study law. And one of the reasons they do this is because they want to be uh, escape from the authority of their brothers and their fathers. Uh, in other words, they want to be modern, they want to be modern women, they want to be autonomous, uh, but they want to be openly uh, um, loyal, if that's the word, to their religious identity at the same time. Now, some people see, see this as a contradiction. I see it as a sign of hope, because I think, and that, that's something that perhaps Europeans could learn from the example of the United States, I think uh, it's not either or. It's not a question of entirely assimilating to uh, Western European um, notions of what it is to be liberal, which has to be secular, which has to be culturally uniform and so on. It should be possible to be a loyal democratic citizen and if you choose to be religious uh, at the same time. Um, and the fact that they study law, I think, is a, a healthy sign because assimilation to the same cultural values is never going to be, is not a, a realistic goal. It's not, not, not going to happen. It may not even be entirely desirable. Uh, I think there is room for cultural diversity. I don't think you can impose common uh, cultural values on people, again, um, with this caveat that violence should never be permissible. Uh, and the French, one of the most distinguished French scholars, in, in my view, of Islam in Europe, Olivier Roy, um, uh, uh, put it this way. He said, uh, it's not, what is important is not to have common values, it's to have common allegiance to the same rules. In other words, as long as you play by the rules of democracy, as long as you abide by the same laws, you can believe anything you want or have the cultural uh, allegiances or values uh, that you wish as well, which is more akin, I think, uh, to the way it is in the United States. Uh, in the United States, if you're an immigrant, you're not uh, forced to or even expected to uh, assimilate or conform to uh, a uniform culture. What you are expected to do is to be a citizen, is to be loyal to the Constitution and so on. Um, and this may not be much. It may not be even in the long run enough to say that the law is the only thing that people, that, that holds a society together. But I would say that the law um, as a protection of our freedoms um, is a, a good start and it's probably the one thing that all of us can agree uh, is worth something that is worth fighting for. Thank you very much. Could you give a few examples of um, something to believe in from a, a secular liberal perspective? In the United States, we've got things like uh, to, to strive for, like universal health care and scaling back the American empire and uh, cutting back on the military, things like that. that. That's a big fight that's going on um, here for progressives. But uh, Europe seems to be already there. And uh, what um, what can secular liberal Europeans uh, believe in and uh, progress towards? Yeah, well, that's, of course, the, the million-dollar question. I mean, the, what gave the, 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 the liberals in the American sense, not in the classical European sense, which is really more laissez-faire economics and so on, but in the American sense, meaning sort of left of center, social democrats, what gave them their impetus since the 19th century was, of course, rooted in Marxism. 
And um, since that has been completely discredited, something will have to take its place. I think the person who comes up with that something is going to be a very famous, if not very rich man. I wish I could be that man. Uh, I can't give you a very easy and clear answer to this. Um, uh, I think protecting the social democratic achievements of Europe is already going to be hard enough. And not only hard, but in some ways, um, uh, conflicting with the other thing that's equally desirable, which is fast integration of immigrants. And this is where I'd remind you of Isaiah Berlin's um, famous uh, dictum that, um, that not all good values are compatible. Um, one of the, something that many people have often believed is that as long as a value is good, it'll be compatible with all the other good values. That's not the case. They can conflict. In this case, having a safety net uh, for um, a wide safety net, a much wider sa and deeper safety net than is, is true in the, in, in the United States uh, economically, protecting jobs, giving people security and so on, is in itself a good thing. But it's not designed to integrate large numbers of uh, immigrants quickly into the workplace. It makes it harder because of protection and so on. Governments are much more geared to, um, in a way, uh, to hand out welfare, to treat immigrants as, as needy cases than uh, they are to opening up the workplace to as many po people as possible, even at a, at a low level. It's much harder to get into the workplace. And that works against the interests in many ways of, of immigrants. So this doesn't really answer your question, but it's, it's simply to illustrate how, how complicated this problem is. I think many would agree that France is a unique example with regards to Muslims living in Europe because of the uh, laicite policy, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, yeah. which uh, prohibits all forms of religious expression in the public square. Uh, the hijab scandal was a direct result of that, and I think the Paris riots reflect the extent to which uh, this is more serious in France. Um, so just, I just was wondering how you see the future with uh, France and Muslims living there, uh, whether or not it's different from the rest of Europe, whether or not they're actually going to give up the laicite policy at all, how it might uh, become compromised in the future and just... Right, well, France is... Uh, uh, one of the big differences, I think, in the Western world is not between the old world and the new world, as many people believe. One of the, the basic dif differences, fault lines, if you like, is between the Catholic tradition and the Protestant one. And the French Revolution, um, which separated church and state, which, which and the French revolutionaries wanted to, to destroy the power of the Catholic Church. They did so uh, because they wanted to protect the state, the republic, from the dangerous uh, and, and autocratic authority of the church. In America, the American Revolution, which was essentially a Protestant one, was the other way around. It was to protect uh, the, the religious from the state from intruding in, on, uh, into their domain. And uh, so when the French uh, get frightened of uh, religious symbols, of the religious um, intruding into the public space, the, 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 what they really fear, of course, is still the specter of, of, of the Catholic Church, the old power of the Catholic Church, which existed before the revolution, the absolutism of, 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 of the Catholics. And that's now being projected on young women in headscarves and so on. As, but behind those young men, women in heads, headscarves is, are the specters of, of priestly power. Um, and that's, this doesn't apply to Protestant countries or, or majority Protestant countries. Um, um, the Paris riots, they're a bit more complicated. They were not Muslim riots or riots of Muslims uh, rebelling against uh, the state. They were a, a very mixed population living in the suburbs of largely immigrants who feel deprived. Um, some of them Muslims, some of them Christians, some, some of them Africans, some of them from Algeria and so on. A uh, very mixed bunch. Had no, the, 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 the impetus of the riots was not a religious one. 
Um, it was actually because, um, and this again makes France somewhat different from other countries in Europe, in many ways it was because the, the, the premise of the French Republic is that all uh, citizens are equal. And uh, you don't look into communal ties or religious ties or cultural differences and so on. Everybody is an equal citizen. This, in theory, in practice, of course, not everybody is treated as uh, equally. And so, in a way, what the, the rioters in the banlieue in France were saying was, we want to be treated like French citizens, like we want to be treated like you. And w this comes back to the question of the social democratic uh, safety nets and so on. The riots in the banlieue followed another demonstration that happened a few weeks earlier, which was staged in Paris by French university students. And they were protesting against uh, a, a, a suggested law that would make it easier for uh, companies to fire um, people who'd, uh, who'd, who'd um, got a job for the first time. And so the students saw a, a kind of privilege that they'd always had. In other words, you know, as soon as you get hired somewhere, you can't really get fired anymore. They saw this, in de this, this under threat. But the immigrants understood this very well. They saw that actually the, 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 you know, the, these students with names like Dupont were being protected at the expense of people called Muhammad who couldn't get these first-time jobs. And so it, it, that was not a religious issue. Um, it, but it had a lot to do with the nature of the French Republic. Thank you. Thank you.